So I like to uh, start with introducing uh, the summer school tonight and um, to introduce our uh, guests tonight, which is super exciting as they're all the way from Ecuador. So thank you so much for joining the Summer School at Penn virtual lecture series. My name is Winka Dubbeldam. I am the Miller Professor and Chair of Architecture um, at the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weissman School of Design. Uh, that is in Philadelphia. Um, we are currently all over the place, I know, but in theory, we are all part of um, the school. Inspired by Penn's uh, recent, Penn students, recent involvement in 3D printing of face masks, masks for uh, the Penn Medicines uh, Hospital, um, I thought it would be really important to see whether we could assist our, stu our students as they are having a uh, hurdle uh, at the moment with the pandemic, pandemic to find internships and um, jobs. So together with Surface Magazine, we came up with this summer school and um, asked the students to create a solution for a COVID-19 testing station. Um, and these are, these are actually, so we are kind of halfway exactly. So we have seen already some of the research of the students as they are progressing, which has been really interesting. I also want to note, uh, talking about recent events, that uh, Mark Lothenberg has stepped away from the summer school as he strongly felt he didn't want to uh, take away from the students' work. Um, of course, these are all really important issues as they are going along. And if you like to discuss these issues, we kindly wait till um, the end of uh, the beautiful presentation we're getting tonight. Uh, and to uh, discuss these issues in the end. Um, and Mark has handed over the mic to um, our Latin LGBT partner, Michael Fragoso, you see in the screen. Um, yeah, so we are, to begin with, we're super grateful to all the people speaking in our uh, summer school. Uh, they're all generously donating their time. We are fully aware of the fact that you're all very, very busy people. And uh, so we can do nothing than be super grateful to you all. So I wanted to start thanking and adding more gratefulness to our uh, own Annabella Gilbert that uh, has proposed and recommended two nice guest speakers, uh, Enrique Bologna Gilbert, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of a French, uh, French version. Perfect. Uh, director of the intensive care unit at the Clinique Guayaquil, and Fabiana Alvaire Gilbert and Manuel Colon Armador, um, both architects uh, of Intempiri Studio, an architecture firm also in Ecuador. So, what is quite special tonight is that we are getting a lecture, which is probably the most amazing combination of facts from uh, both architects and the medical profession, which we've had separated, but never in one uh, presentation. So to introduce you further, Enrique Bologna Gilbert is the director and um, is also an associate professor in critical care and internal medicine at the Univers Universidad Espiritu Santa Medical School. He attended the medical school at uh, Universidad Católica de Santiago de Guayaquil and had fellowships at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. As a critical care provider, he's on the front lines of COVID-19 treatment in his community, which has been um, astounding. I, I personally have a lot of uh, friends from Ecuador and it's been mortifying to see what you all had to go through. Uh, Fabiana Alviar Gilbert and Manuel Colon Amador are the co-founders of the studio. Fabiana studied architecture at Cornell and Harvard, and she previous, previously practiced at a landscape architecture firm in Boston. Manuel also studied at Cornell and has taught in the architecture programs at Cornell, Syracuse, University of Puerto Rico, Polytechnical University of Puerto Rico, and the Catholic University of Santiago de Guayaquil. He has also practiced in Boston and Taipei, of all places. That was a quite, quite an interesting jump, I thought. Uh, please join me in welcoming Enrique, Fabiana, and Manuel to the Surface Summer School at Penn. Welcome, 
And thank you so much for joining us tonight. So I would say, uh, and thank you, of course, again, Annabella. Uh, I would say, if you like, uh, start your presentation or start with um, a few words. Thank you very much. And we want to th uh, take first the time uh, this, to thank you for this opportunity and to give us a platform to share our experience and lessons from the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so let's start with our presentation so we can. So before we begin, Manuel and I founded in the first studio, which is a small design practice that navigates within the disciplines of architecture, urbanism, and landscape. Uh, however, this lecture was born uh, from a series of conversations, both uh, personal and professional with Dr. Bologna, which we'll later uh, hear from during the pandemic. And on a personal note, we have experienced firsthand the medical system of the city because we had a baby at the peak of this crisis. And we had to practice architecture during this time and we continue to practice architecture through this new normal of electronic social distancing. Uh, we're now we're aware of these hygienic, new hygienic practices that have changed our daily lives. Um, but let's start setting up the context. Um, so the city of Guayaquil is located in Ecuador, which is in South America. It's not the capital, but it's the largest city in the country. And it's located an hour and a half away from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this city uh, with a large metropolitan region that combines uh, Guayaquil, San Borondon, Daule, and Duran have a total of approximate uh, 3.5 uh, million inhabitants. Uh, making it, just to give you a sense of scale, it's twice the size of Philadelphia. Um, it's a city that is geographically surrounded by rivers and estuaries and has had an urban uh, transition and the way that it has been occupied has been through these uh, land, um, land reclamation and sort of taking over the estuary. And it's a city that is in constant movement, in constant growth. Um, its urban configuration um, is one categorized as an endless sprawl. However, in contrast to the American suburb, that is one of low density. Guayaquil sprawl is categorized by two to three story housing units that house more than one family per unit usually, uh, with an average family composition of more than five members. These units usually have multi-generational multi members, meaning that we have, you know, from children to grandparents living in the same unit, which were very important during this crisis. Um, one thing that we can like look in this image is that all that what we're looking from before, it's land that has been taken over from the water. So it's been a process of reclamation over years and years and the city has grown. And this is what are one of our major suburbs that are on top of the surface of the water, which is quite important to, to, to denote that this city has been kind of like in constant, in constant changes and, and fluxes. But this sort of informal growth that has now transformed to this now formal space have left the city with a lack of public space, infrastructure, and some of very, a lot of, uh, well, very little green areas. Therefore, these suburbs that define the majority of the city lack uh, public spaces and require people to occupy the street. So the basic, all their basic necessities are performed at the street level for commerce, for leisure, for work making the street the public realm, and also a very important thing to make in the city and to expand the outbreak of the virus. And these images are from a few weeks ago, and you can see people that are with masks, playing volleyball, soccer, but at the same time already sort of in, in engaging within the public realm. So, Guayaquil was the center of the outbreak in Latin America the same way that New York was the center of the outbreak and the epidemic in North America. These are some of the headlines and the media across the globe that categorize the city as an example of what were to happen to similar urban centers with scarce resources and weak infrastructure. Uh, the images that floated in the media were ones that depicted chaos in the street, burial sites, 
lack of burial sites, agglomeration, fear, loss, and a lot of grief. But these images that were exclusive at the time, at the beginning of the pandemic, were exclusive to Guayaquil at the beginning. However, they're now replicated throughout the world. So, but this is for, for us, we could say that is our first hand, our first depiction to a generation of this sort of chaos. But historically, we have dealt with this before. This is an image uh, or, or print of seven, uh, 1350 of the plague in Europe, people agglomerating within the burial grounds of the plague. And today we have a bigger factor, which is globalization. And globalization just works both ways. Not only us sending bananas to, to the north, and if it's also the information from the north translating urbanly in the south. The miracle drug, hydroxychloroquine, it just flooded our streets with people trying to access the, 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 the drug. But also, it also happens that we also have our own sort of colloquial at idiosyncrasies, like, uh, the, like having um, excess of vitamin C, uh, sort of people were thinking that it was gonna be part of, uh, of the solution to the, to the pandemic, but it's, you can see that it flourished as we see in the street. So what happened to Guayaquil now that we are 60 days, 70 days uh, ahead of time, we're gonna look at what, why it became the perfect storm. Historically, Ecuadorian had migrated to the United States, to New York, New Jersey, and into Europe, to Spain and Italy. And that being the case, we have very large population of Ecuadorians living outside of Ecuador. As the pandemic becomes a crisis in Europe and, and, and in the United States, we have our own sort of migrants, students, and people who are flying away, uh, who are flying on leisure, coming back in January, February, and March, right before the lockdown. So we experienced 40,000 more passengers in the international flight arena. Also, right now is our summer season, or what we call the monsoon season, where it's a rainy season in the city, but it, it also has uh, an effect on epidemiology, where we have dengue, which is a mosquito transmitted disease. So it also has the same sort of symptoms as COVID, which it could be sort of trans, uh, it could be uh, confused, confused with, the with some of the symptoms that COVID was provided. Also right now it's our summer season where uh, we migrate to the beach. We go in, into traveling around the countries that the children are not in school in, from K to 12. So we have a lot of excess of mobility and uses of the public space. And one thing that we have to, 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 to consider is what do Guayaquileños do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so the city was labeled by people from Ecuador and globally as the city that was being disobedient mm -hmm. and not responding to the lockdown and not responding to the, the requirements by the government. But I think it was a very unfair categorization of our city because 60% of our citizens depend on informal of the informal economy. So they're living on a day-to-day -day basis. So it is impossible to ask the city of Guayaquil to be on a permanent lockdown, while the majority of the citizens cannot afford to buy basic needs for no longer than a couple of days. And this became a huge problem, and a problem that the city had to solve, the local municipality as well as the national government, in order to send food uh, to a lot of households at the same time to avoid the massive movement of people at markets or in the street or trying to work just in order to get their daily lives. And not only food, also cleaning supplies and, and sanitary kits in order for people to survive the isolation process. And these are the images of people just needing to be outside and do their day-to-day -day work, you know? Not only we're seeing street vendors, but we can see electricians, people who work in construction that are part of this economy that needs to do day-to-day -day business. Barbers, um, auto, shop, auto shops, okay. and things like that. So what is another factor that made Guayaquil the perfect storm? We could talk about the Ecuadorian healthcare system. It's concentrating in the two major cities, Quito, the capital, and Guayaquil, the, 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 major, the largest city. We have 24,000 beds, and we have about two-thirds of those two beds, of those beds concentrated in, in these two cities. 
and we look specifically at our, our city, Guayaquil, this is the, the, the system, the, the hospital system that dealt with COVID-19. We're talking about 18 hospitals within private, public, and uh, state partnership, all of them. We have the bigger crosses are hospitals that have about 400 beds. The middle crosses are about hospitals that have 200 beds. And the, the smaller private hospitals had about 60 to 150 beds. Once we start like uh, putting more information in, we can see that we have 6,000 beds and 52% of those beds are private. And we have uh, about 13 beds for 100 uh, inhabitants. And then, like we said at the beginning, the first access to care was these uh, pharmacies that are scattered throughout the city and became focal points of infection where people were sort of in stress and in this sort of in, in certainty of, of of the early stages of the pandemic, trying to access medicine. Because it, to the difference of uh, pharmacies in the United States, here you only need prescriptions for narcotics. You could get other medicine without prescriptions. Now, if we look more specifically at where the testing sites and the private testing site, the PCR being the swab and the serology being the blood test, we have a few places at, at the pandemic that were very, they were, had long lines, only two drive-through areas. And these, most of these places also will do home testing, but they will, you will call through the phone and will be, will be two to three days, or you can make an appointment in, 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 the, in the speed of that. But it's very clear if you go to the testing sites, the lack of testing sites at the ma major parts of the city. So they're very focalized and they're very centralized. And it is also very important to know that these were all paid uh, tests. So the majority of people could not afford to go to these testing sites. Plus, we didn't, and the city didn't want people to be moving and concentrating in, in these areas. So the government, both locally and nationally, had to deploy the brigades of med, uh, doctors to go and nurses. and nurses to go do test sites door to door. So this, while it was done very efficiently and in a way tried to concentrate and cover all these areas, it was going to take much more time than just going to the site. And it required a lot of planning and a lot of data that had to come back to the city in order to start putting people in quarantine and moving to hospitals. So by the time this was all set up, you know, we had hit a very high peak in terms of the number of people that had been infected with the virus. But these efforts gives us a clear picture that you see right now in this image of where the infection of the city was and it allows us to sort of prepare for the next phase. And finally, we add to this layer the funeral homes that are scattered through the city and the cemetery burial grounds that were the last piece of this infrastructure, what we call this city COVID networks. Okay. Finally, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Enrique Bologna. Um, okay, good evening, and, and thank you again for the invitation. It's truly a pleasure. Uh, so as you already heard, I'm not, a, I'm not an architect. Uh, I work in a, in a critical care unit with a, a group of highly specialized professionals. Uh, we take care of the sickest people in the hospital. Uh, it doesn't matter what caused your condition. It could be an accident, trauma, it could be a heart attack, or a severe infection of COVID. Uh, I don't know if I can explain exactly why I'm here today. I, I'll try to justify my, my presence by sharing my experience at Clinica Guayaquil, by sharing my experience from the other side of the, of the, of the front line and, and how we collaborated with Manuel and, 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 and Fabiana in, in, in this, uh, these few last weeks. Next, please. So uh, how did we prepare? Uh, initially, the Ministry of Health had decided that all COVID patients had to be taken care of in two designated hospitals. Uh, we knew that this was gonna be insufficient uh, and they were gonna get overwhelmed fairly quickly. We had the luxury of time. So we were able to prepare literally in our parking lot area, oxygen uh, preparations, as you see in the, in the walls here. And uh, this served as a triage area, a place where we could uh, evaluate patients, allocate them either to COVID units or to non-COVID units. You have to remember that during this time, we're still caring for other people. People were still having heart attacks and strokes, and we had to uh, figure out a plan so we could care for both of these types of populations uh, uh, fairly efficiently. 
uh, in the middle of all of this, unfortunately, we were under renovation. So our, my ICU was actually closed down. But we created these COVID-19 wards and we prepared areas for PPE, so for personal equipment uh, uh, preparation, a pharmacy, and then basically hospital rooms that were adapted in order to care for these patients who normally would be in an in a intensive care unit. We basically moved the ICU outside of their normal boundaries and we took it to where our patients were. This of course created some, some difficulties. The, you know, the flow of patients was not ideal, uh, but we had to, to, to survive. So this is basically uh, a, a patient's room, initially uh, maybe uh, uh, hosting one or two patients. And, and here we had to allocate three patients. We had a little nurse station outside we moved our ventilators. We had to put our monitors on, on little side beds, infusion pumps, and personnel to try to care for these patients. Next, please. This is uh, uh, next. Next slide, please. So we really felt this way. It, it was no no different than the the Spanish flu uh, in the 1900s, uh, 1918. Uh, I found this this photo fascinating uh, because I have always. Uh, uh, wonder why uh, this this special mask, right? This this beak, this bird-like uh, costume, almost. And I, I I recently just found out that it really has a purpose. It has some functionality. This beak uh, served as a reservoir for nice-smelling substances that doctors would put in in order to survive the stench of the dead bodies in the city. So it's not just a, a look. It, it really had a, a purpose. So I've um, always been fascinated since, since I heard this story. Next, please. This is one of my, uh, next. This is one of my favorite photos. It really, it really captures uh, the essence of, and the passion of, of my personnel. So this is one of my, my ICU nurses and, and she's about to enter ground zero. She's about to enter a war zone. She's gonna uh, don on her, her her protection equipment personal uh, equipment and she's dancing she's dancing as she's entering her job place and it really it really showed up uh, the best and the worst of everybody but in general uh, we, were, we were so lucky to have such an incredible team helping us uh, survive this pandemic next please all throughout this uh, this crisis we we had a, a total of 12 doctors contract COVID-19 Six of them uh, got it outside of the hospital. Uh, fortunately, only three of them ended up hospitalized. None of them ended up in mechanical ventilation. A total of 18 nurses got COVID-19 out of 201. Uh, but even, even that, that creates a lot of difficulties with scheduling and, and difficulties with work. But we're able to, to pull through. Next, please. So the epidemiologic weeks, uh, in 12 through 16 or 12 through 15, those four weeks were truly, truly uh, a nightmare. We were getting five to six pa sick patients a day. Uh, all of them coming to the intensive care unit requiring of a lot for a lot of care. These patients are not getting quick better uh, quickly. They're, they're taking some time, prolonged ICU uh, hospitalizations. And these were my hell weeks. Uh, so this is just to show you how I really felt. This is this is what I call hell week. I was I was scared shitless. I've never felt this way before. I, I, I trained in a in a large institution in the United States. I saw a lot of sick patients, uh, but I've never felt this way. This was a different beast. Next, please. This from my living quarters. So I got kicked out of my room. Uh, my wife uh, and my daughters uh, had to be protected. I never knew if I was going to come back infected. So I had to move to my office upstairs. I had a little bike that I rarely use, small little bed. This was my shower outside. Uh, so basically I would come in, come home, get through a, a full therapy of disinfection before I could go home. So again, back to what our strategy was, we had to have an ICU without borders. Intensive care needed to be a service and not a place. We needed to be malleable, trans we need to transform, needed to bring the ICU to our patients. So this is these, again, these are just regular hospital rooms and we had to bring the ICU to them, even dialysis. Uh, and let me share a little bit of our patients' uh, demographics and profiles. 
So uh, throughout these 12 weeks, we hospitalized a total of 201 patients. Almost 70% of them were men. Uh, we were only able to confirm uh, positive uh, status of COVID in 71% of them because testing was so limited. Most of, or ha almost half of our patients were transferred from outside institutions. We are part of a, a network of, of, of healthcare uh, that serves the government. So whoever's too complex to be cared in the public hospital can be transferred to our institution. I really think this is a great mechanism to deliver care to those who need it the most. Our, our patients were pretty sick. Our average uh, length of stay was 12 days. Uh, most of them had been sick for about seven days before coming to the hospital. Our overall mortality was 25. So we lost 52 people out of these 201. As you can see, mortality goes up exponentially as we get older. So younger patients do well, older patients not so, not so good. Next, please. Uh, we were told that most people who ended up in the hospital had a, a lot of comorbidities and these were sick people and healthy people would not get uh, ill and be in the hospital. And this didn't turn out to be so true. Only about 40% of our patients had hypertension. Less than 30% of our patients were diabetic. Uh, obesity tended to be, and being overweight tended to be a common thing uh, for sure, but not a lot of comorbidities in our population. Most of these patients were fairly young. Our average age was 56. Next. Next. What about symptoms on admission? Uh, so most of, uh, as you know, most of these patients were in respiratory failure. So we're short of breath, uh, they had a cough, they had fever, they felt uh, poorly, they had fatigue and malaise. Uh, we also started noticing the GI symptoms, so gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea, abdominal pain, vomiting were common. About 10% of our patients had anosmia, so the loss of the sense of smell. These are the most critical patients. These are patients who ended up in, in mechanical ventilation, just to show you that this was definitely a, a, a marker of a, a poor prognosis. If you were sick enough to end up in mechanical ventilation, your mortality went up exponentially. Our mortality was 67%. But over the, over the world, uh, mortality rates have been rated in this paper in New York at 88%. Other places like at Atlanta and Boston showed much better numbers in the 30s and 40s. Um, next, please. This is a, a, a paper, next, please. This is a, a document that's about to be next, about to be presented by uh, Dr. Jean-Louis Vincent. Jean-Louis is, is kind of like the Tom Main of, 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 of critical care. Uh, he's a superstar. He's publishing this uh, paper on 14,000 patients. And what he's noticing is, this is a meta-analysis, that mortality on those patients who ended up on mechanical ventilation is 83%. So it's a, this is a terribly, uh, uh, terribly high mortality for patients with uh, respiratory distress. Next, please. So what metrics should we use? I mean, if we look at uh, metrics reported by a country and even by uh, data at Johns Hopkins or Worldometer, usually they, they report number of cases, they report uh, registered mortality. But unfortunately, these are confirmed cases. You know? So if you're in a country where there's under testing, there's under registering, it's very hard to really trust these, these numbers. They really show us the, the, the real picture of what's going on. Uh, so burials in Guayaquil, uh, this is very hard data. This is, this is tough to see. But in, in this green line in the bottom, what I'm showing is that the average number of deaths per day in Guayaquil is usually 38. And during about two to three weeks in March and April, we peaked at around 400 deaths per day. So we had 10, more, 10 times more deaths per day for about two weeks. And this is what collapsed not only our medical system, but also our funerary system. Uh, uh, funerary services and, and homes. Next, please. So our, our mortality was comparable to what happened in, in Northern Italy, right? in the province of Bergamo was also having 400% plus mortalities uh, over the usual number of deaths per, per, uh, per week. Next, please. So as Oscar says, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. This is one of my favorite quotes, continue. Let me just mention a little bit about treatments. I know you're not doctors, but you've probably been reading on, 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 on uh, Twitter and all over the news about these 
good news and bad news. Our medication protocols change uh, throughout uh, throughout the weeks, right? So initially we were using hydro hydroxychloroquine too. Uh, eventually we dropped it. Uh, new drugs are starting appearing and coming into 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 play, right? Uh, steroids that are cortisone derived medications. Uh, we initially were were sold by the the Chinese uh, based on their publications that these these drugs were uh, dangerous. That people who would use them would have prolonged courses, increased mortalities. However, out of necessity, uh, we we and many others throughout the world started using them outside of trials because we didn't have much to do. We people were dying left and right, and we had to try something differently. Uh, so just as just an observation, of course, this is not a, a randomized controlled trial or anything like that, but we give steroids to 59 of 71 patients, or 83% of our my ventilated patients got steroids. And our mortality uh, rate on those in that group was 38% of, instead of the 67. So it's just a little bit to show you of what we're learning day to day. Next, please. Another therapy that was tried was convalescent plasma. So this plasma that with antibodies from people who recovered, it really unfortunately didn't pan out very well. Let me share with you a few images. I know your your people would probably appreciate this. And this is what we call crazy paving and ground glassing. These are typical CT scans of patients with, with COVID-19. Next. This is kind of interesting. So this is a CT chest, a CT scan of the chest of a patient. And as you can see, there's some asymmetry in the amount of disease. All the white areas are affected lung. All the dark black areas are normal lung. So there's very little normal lung in this patient in the left. Uh, but as you can see, it's pretty asymmetrical. So one of the things that we're doing and we've been learning over, uh, about this over the last uh, few years is to prone patients. So we basically flip them over and we ask them to stay in that position because that way we kind of change this, this balance between air spaces and blood flow, and we create better oxygenation and patients tend to do better. This is something pretty benign, cheap to do, with very little chance of harming, and it's, it's, it's a promising therapy. There are a few studies that are, are running right now like this optiprone, and hopefully we'll get some good information out of those. Next, please. Next. So this is, this is my team. Uh, this is the way he, one of my patients' uh, son saw the situation. Uh, you, you have to remember, patients get sick, they come to the hospital, and all they can they can do is communicate to their family members through their phone. You know, where you know FaceTiming when they're sick, FaceTiming when they're getting better, FaceTiming just to tell them their family members didn't make it. This is the son of a, of a patient of mine, a guy who was only 44 years old, and this is how he saw kind of saw the the, the situation. Right, his father's in in bed. Technically, I'm this guy here, but it's pretty interesting how he kind of sees the whole picture. Next, please. So this is my team, and uh, we have to remember that our lives as healthcare practitioners have changed forever. Uh, I don't think we will ever be the same. The way we interact with coworkers, even with our family members, has changed uh, for good. Um, next, please. We're preparing, we're preparing and we're, we're adapting and then we're increasing. And I cannot finish this presentation without uh, uh, showing a picture of these three strong, uh, powerful ladies here. Uh, two doctors and a hospital administrator. These are the force, these are the motor behind what I do. They're in their thirties and these ladies are my bosses. Uh, they are the ones that let me uh, perform my, 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 my job day to day uh, without difficulties and it would have been impossible to do it without them. So I'm, I'm very thankful and I'm, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. So um, as we've been having conversations with Dr. Bologna as family members and as professionals, uh, we believe that this crisis has put everyone into test, every single profession. And as designers, we have to think what we can give back to the city and what we can have and what we have learned from this situation. As a practice, we're beginning to collect more data in order to respond to this and support the city in this future crisis and join them in the planning. Uh, we're trying to give back uh, with you know, seeing uh, what is missing or you know, what was very successful in terms of planning and organization of the city. It has made us question what is our role as architects and as urban designers in this sort of uh, crisis. 
The pandemic revealed a lot of weaknesses that we knew our city had. However, I think it demonstrated the resilience and flexibility that the city as an organism has. The same way a hospital like Clinica Guayaquil adapted and excelled through this nightmare, the city has begun to reorganize as a response to this crisis. So I think we as a crisis, we as a design practice, we have, you know, questioning and talking to doctors realize the, the requirements in design and in architecture that depend now more than ever in terms of flexibility of space and how we have to adapt. So we cannot create these permanent spaces, but they have to be able to change in its use and its program. Uh, I think we've seen it all over the world as convention centers become hospitals and clinics and they will and we don't know for how much longer we're gonna continue this way. So I think we have to prepare and question our role, you know, every day more than ever.